This has been a long and challenging day. So how many followers did you lose when you switched from Belieber to <laughs> Trump? <laughs> Dex, one kid left. Oh, man. Shit. Uh, <laughs> I got killed. Again? Pope Francis kicked two cardinals, who are both facing scandals, out of his close group of advisors. Francisco Javier Arazariz, the former Archbishop of Santiago, is accused of covering up allegations of child abuse, which he denies. Cardinal George Pell faces charges of child sexual abuse, which he also denies. Americans are ready to climb out of this darkness. That's why I'm exploring a candidacy for President of the United States in 2020. Julian Castro, the former housing chief, announced today that next month he'll say whether he's really running. But the field of maybes is already filling up. Some unexpected names have filed paperwork with the Federal Election Commission. Some have set up fundraising committees, and others have already stopped by the battleground state of Iowa. A delegate representing Houthi rebels in peace talks with Yemen's government says they've agreed to drop their fight for the country's main port in Hodeidah, though they haven't yet signed off on a proposal to reopen the airport in Sana'a. Both are key to getting food and aid into a country where millions are starving. We don't have our own apartment anymore, and we've been staying in all different kinds of places. When Lily debuted on Sesame Street in 2011, she didn't always have enough to eat, teaching kids about food insecurity. Now, the nonprofit behind Sesame Street is reintroducing her as homeless to reflect the one in 30 American children who are living in Lily's situation. That means no matter where I am, there's always hope and love. <laughs> we love you, Lily. Yes, we do. Theresa May had enough problems already. She's trying to steer a Brexit process she never wanted and is tethered to an exit deal that Britain hates and the EU won't change. This morning, she woke up with a new challenge, a confidence vote from her own party. A change of leadership in the Conservative Party now will put our country's future at risk and create uncertainty when we can least afford it. The 2016 Brexit referendum was meant to put an end to bitter arguments about whether the UK was better off without the EU. Instead, it blew it wide open, and the ruling Conservative Party is now eating itself alive. All the benefits of Brexit in Santa's sack. <laughs> what will the new leader achieve? Uh, we need a, an enthusiastic person who believes in leave, sees the wonderful opportunities for the United Kingdom if we deliver on the manifesto commitment on which all, every Conservative MP was elected, which was also endorsed by the Labour Party. But so, isn't this the only deal? What will a new leader achieve? No, we go back. We, we know this deal will not go through Parliament. Worse, if it somehow did get through Parliament, we lose the DUP and we're into a general election because we do lose DUP support. Unfortunately for the besieged Prime Minister, her party's civil war happened to come to a head on a Wednesday, the day of her regularly scheduled grilling in Parliament, where the bloodthirsty opposition we're ready and waiting. Totally and absolutely unacceptable to this house in any way. The Prime Minister and her government have already been found to be in contempt of Parliament. The biggest, the biggest threat, the biggest threat to people and to this country isn't leaving the EU, it's a Corbyn government. Afterwards, May sent her most powerful allies out to defend her and the deal. All morning, they've been tweeting messages of support for their leader. But in real life, they could barely hide their concern. Prime Minister is going to win tonight, what's and she good, deserves to win. What's a good margin? No, but this is, just, this is just a complete waste of time, isn't it? Um, Do you well, agree? I don't know about that, but it's nice to see you. Will she win? Will she win? I have an appointment just over there. Will you be voting for, for the Prime Minister tonight, Mr Fox? You have your full I shall be voting for the Prime Minister tonight and I'll continue to serve her to the best of my ability. Has the risk of no deal significantly increased because of this? There always has been a risk of no deal. And, and does this uh, make the, it more... This, I think that what we, well, MPs have to determine ultimately is what do they want? Do they want to have a deal which sees us exit the European <laughs> Union? What do you uh, want well, personally? Um, do you with, want the with, deal? With, As Minister, what do you want? So I, as I want us to leave the European Union and I want us to do it in a way that causes 
uh, minimal disruption and maximal opportunity for Britain. It says a lot about the current state of British politics that the most rational voice of the day was coming from someone who's been nicknamed Mr Shouty Stop Brexit Man. And do you feel like we're a step closer to having Brexit stopped in this country? Brexit is never going to happen. I'm absolutely convinced. Better the devil you know. Nobody wants that poison chalice. Whoever takes that from her is finished anyway. As night fell, May met behind closed doors with MPs from across her party to try and shore up her support. But she seemed to know that in the end, this wasn't really about her. It was about the choice between her deal, which is unpopular, and no deal, which is far worse. Proving once again that, as the saying goes, May's weakness is her greatest strength. The result uh, of the ballot uh, held this evening is that the Parliamentary Party does have confidence. Yeah. This has been a long and challenging day, but at the end of it, I'm pleased to have received the backing of my colleagues in tonight's ballot. Whilst I'm grateful for that support, a significant number of colleagues did cast a vote against me, and I've listened to what they said. I think we should be getting on with trying to negotiate a deal with Europe and within Parliament. It was a failed coup by what yeah. some people have described as the extremists in your party. What should happen to them now? Well, from uh, the only way we're going to get this vote through is for us to begin reaching out to people again and bringing them back. What's been achieved? The party has kicked the can down the road and we're running out of road, we're running out of time. The withdrawal agreement has not got a solution that's going to be acceptable to the House of Commons. Surviving the day doesn't prove that May will survive in the long term, but it does prove she's got an asset that others don't. The willpower to keep muddling through this mess. Michael Cohen, President Trump's former lawyer and right-hand man, was sentenced to three years in prison today for tax evasion, lying to Congress, and breaking campaign finance laws. Prosecutors have also reached a deal with American Media Inc., owners of the National Enquirer. They admit to paying $150,000 to suppress a story on one of Trump's alleged affairs and are now cooperating with investigators. Between Michael Cohen's sentencing an AMI's immunity agreement, today was a very bad day for Donald Trump. The implications are massive, nuanced, and far-reaching. It's time for some serious journalism. Also, tweets. It's time for tweets. So I posted the story. I, I didn't really give much commentary. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. That's where Ed and Brian Krasenstein come in. So that's 30 likes in 37 seconds. I think it's a pretty big, big moment. I, I already tweeted with Hill Reporter mm -hmm. a few seconds ago. So. Ed and Brian are twin brothers who do everything together. They work together. Cohen was sentenced to 36 months. They work out together. <sighs> they live in matching giant houses in the same Fort Myers neighborhood. And since late 2016, together they have become the masters of the so-called hashtag resistance tweet. Tweets that goad Trump, suggest Russia is behind everything, and call for the president's impeachment multiple times a day, every day. All with plenty of exclamation points. I think the tweet that I have seen that for me defines your account is, or I think it was you, Brian, had a tweet that was just said impeach Trump like nine times in a row. I don't, I don't remember. I mean, it's, it's very possible <laughs> I tweeted that. <laughs> Sounds well, like Brian. What does that, that, but what does that do? What does that add to the conversation to have that? I just think that it's just kind of throwing it out there that this guy should be impeached. I, I mean, it do, that doesn't add anything in particular to the conversation besides just putting it out there and letting people retweet that they think Trump should be impeached. Oh, we, we have a lot of tweets that are just baloney. I mean, there's a lot of tweets we make that basically are pointless. The Krasensteins don't care much about policy. They tweet exclusively about Trump's corruption and his attacks on minorities and women. And it's resonating. They have a combined 1.4 million followers. I just kind of wanted to get the story out there as soon as I could. It's been retweeted 46 times and liked 175 times. And unlike lots of hashtag resistance figures, 
they're not ideologically hardcore. If you're a Trump supporter, I'm not going to think any differently of you. Yeah, well, like, I, I, I might disagree with what you're, how you think, but but you think it your way for a reason. I have friends and family that have those opinions, and I'm, I totally respect that. I'd say half of our friends down here in Florida are Trump supporters. Hey guys, we're live. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Cole Before they were political internet guys, the Krasensteins were just Russia. internet guys. You know, those guys who just somehow make money from the internet. I, I think we always tried to jump on n new niches. So we did virtual reality. We had some uh, celebrity like fan forum things, search engine optimization, webmaster forum, stuff like that. Is it true that one of the Twitter accounts was originally a Justin Bieber fan account? My account was originally my account for uh, one of our fan club websites, which was a, it was a yeah Justin Bieber fan club. Then it evolved into this anti-Trump account. So how many followers did you lose when you switched from Belieber to Trump? I didn't didn't notice losing any. It was so long ago. I don't really, I I wasn't really keeping track. The Krasensteins don't just tweet about Trump. They also run an ad-driven news site called HillReporter.com. People being freaked out about Trump. Is that the newest you know niche? From a business standpoint, that's not why we why we started doing it. It and people are going to say that that's what we're doing. But. Uh, we, it, we do have ads on those on those sites and it's bringing in revenue, but we haven't taken any of that money as of now. It's all being reinvested into hiring new writers and building up the technology that the site is, the site runs on. Will we take a profit from eventually? Maybe. And I mean, everybody has to make money, right? Right. Okay. And you're not, I, but you seem it. like you're a little defensive about it. Why are you a little well, defensive? Well, about I, it? I think we're defensive about it because. So many, so many people on Twitter. A lot of them say that we're we're grifters and we're we're just tweeting this because we want to make money, and it, it kind of bothers me because because I know that that's not what what I'm doing this for. If people think they're grifters, it's partially because at one point the government appeared to think they were too. In 2016, the FBI raided their houses as part of an investigation into some of their advertisers linked to a Russian Ponzi scheme. Ed and Brian denied knowing what was going on. They were never charged with a crime, and they settled. So it was like a settlement with the government yeah. to give them how much money? 200 and some thousand each. So about half a million about between that. two of yeah. you. Yeah. They still have other online businesses, but most of their days are now focused on one guy. Do you think Trump sees your tweets? I imagine he's seen our tweets in the past. Uh, that, that's not our goal. Like, I don't really care if he sees my tweets. I just want other people to see our tweets and see that see what the truth is, see, see us fact-checking his tweets. That's more important to me than Trump seeing my tweets. I don't, like, what's that gonna, he sees my tweets, who cares? Well, that leads me to the big question, which is, like, does any of it matter? Maybe it's helping one person. Maybe it's helping two people. Maybe it's helping a hundred people see, see facts for what they are. If it makes one person go to Google and fact-check what the president says, then that's, I think it's worth it. Today, the Senate voted to move forward with a resolution that would ban the U.S. military from supporting Saudi Arabia's military operations in Yemen. The measure is still being debated, but if it passes, it would be a rebuke of Saudi Arabia for the murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. I absolutely believe that if the Crown Prince came before a jury here in the United States of America, he would be convicted guilty. The measure invokes the War Powers Resolution, a 1973 law that requires a president to get congressional approval before sending American troops to war. It rarely gets used, and it's unclear what impact the resolution might have. When Congress challenged President Obama over U.S. involvement in Libya, Obama simply said the War Powers Resolution didn't apply. Given President Trump's flourishing bromance with the Saudis, he could certainly do the same. Million. Now, today's vote is about a lot of things. For some senators, it's about reigning in Saudi Arabia. For others, curbing the brutal civil war in Yemen. And for others, it's about the powers of the presidency. And while a lot of them are pretty new to that debate, there's one senator who's been trying for years to back Congress's war powers, Kentucky Republican Rand Paul. The Saudi Arabia issue has become the perfect hook to get his colleagues to pay attention. Earlier this year, there was a vote on a similar measure, didn't get through, the Senate was tabled. 
a lot more people have come on board with your point of view, but I don't think they're coming on board because of the war powers issue. I think they're coming on board because people are pissed at Saudi Arabia. But it's still a step in the right direction. You know, no matter how you get your coalition, getting a coalition that is making a statement on war is a good thing. I think a lot of it is people are horrified by what happened to the dissident uh, Khashoggi and horrified that it could have happened in a country's consulate, horrified that that country has lied to us. And then there's also those of us who are also horrified by what they're doing in the war in Yemen. So all of it adding up brings a coalition, maybe not all for the same reasons. And you're hearing this strange talk of the Constitution that uh, you know Congress should be involved with whether we declare a war. And really, you haven't heard that kind of discussion in a long, long time around here. That discussion continued on the Senate floor today. This war has not been authorized by Congress and is therefore unconstitutional. CIA Director Gina Haspel also returned to Capitol Hill today to brief some House members on Khashoggi's killing. When she was on the Senate side last week, those senators came out of that meeting even more convinced the Crown Prince was behind the murder. But Republicans in the House have made it clear they have no plans to vote on the president's war powers this term. They even used the Farm Bill, you know, the one about crop subsidies and conservation, to block a vote about Yemen and war powers. The thing is, it might not matter whether the resolution actually goes anywhere. Many foreign policy experts agree that in the world of diplomacy, symbolic votes can be meaningful. It's a very loud, large symbol to have one body of Congress vote to say we should no longer be supporting Saudi Arabia in a war. And I think that their government and the royal family will say, hmm, we risk really becoming a pariah in the U.S. We've been allies for so long. Do we really want to have a problem where we can't even buy parts for our airplanes? So I think the Saudis are waking up, and I think there will be a discussion within the royal family. Do you think you can keep that momentum going past the Christmas break into the new term, even I, with a Democratic House? I think some of it depends on the behavior of Saudi Arabia. And so if Is they, bombing they, Yemen more at the port and, and hitting civilians enough of a behavior problem when it doesn't involve killing someone who, was I a, think that who lived the, in America? That, that, that on the heels of, of killing the dissident Khashoggi, I think is enough to keep the ball rolling. Just right in front of you, right in front of you. Behind you, behind you. I marked the purple one. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, that's a good one. Corey Souza works as a computer software salesman, but he's also got a new side hustle, tutoring people in Fortnite. Fortnite itself is a pretty simple game. You're dropped into an island with 99 other people and a bunch of guns. The last player standing wins. Dex, one kid left. Oh, oh man, okay. Pressure it's on you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I got killed. Again? Okay, got him. All right, that's it. All right, well, we won. It's <laughs> the game. That is my first and win. Now you dance, look. Well, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Fortnite isn't the only Battle Royale style game out there, but it is the most popular, with over 200 million players and tournaments on YouTube and Twitch that draw huge audiences. And the bigger the game gets, the more potential clients for Corey. So there's the profile. My there, there you are. Yeah. 18,000 kills, are you yeah. serious? It adds up, it adds up. <laughs> um, what do you charge? Um, so right now it's 15 an hour. Okay. And that's basically, I, I did some research on what others pay and I just kind of went in the middle. What kind of people pay for Fortnite lessons? Any parent who, who sees their kid like struggling to play, to me it's not different than like someone who, who their kid wants to get better at guitar or piano or... A lot of kids have pressure to be good at it, even in school settings. Like, you know the kids who are like bad at Fortnite nowadays. Is this what kids are freaking out about at school now? Kids talk, it's just like if a kid's bad at basketball and mm. their confidence goes down because of it. Oh, there's another airplane. Yeah. Get it. Jace Bijabing is 10. He's been playing Fortnite for about a year, and he's pretty good, but not as good as some of his friends. At what point did you decide, hey, I want a tutor? I never decided that. He just got me one. You just got him a tutor? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You got your kid a video game tutor? Yeah, I did. I'm a CrossFit coach, and I know that 
Learning to be coached is an important part of life. If you want to be good at something, mm -hmm. find someone better than you at that thing and ask for help. So yeah, I got him a, <laughs> I got him a Fortnite coach, man. He did a <laughs> session. It was great. I, well, I sat there and watched the whole session. And then, and then he gave him homework. Gave him homework? You got homework for Fortnite? I was fine with it because it wasn't school homework. <laughs> But not everyone wants to do their homework. So the Fortnite gray market has provided an alternative, boosting. For a couple hundred bucks, elite players like Christopher L. Dobb will log into your account and win for you. So you get all the kills, wins, and upgrades that you want. This is his full-time job. He gets about 30 boosting orders a month and contracts three of his friends to help out. He occasionally gets requests for tutoring but boosting requests outnumber those by about 50 to 1. Why would somebody want you to log in and play for them? They're not good enough. They're not putting the time to get good at the game. So things like wins might be harder for them. And maybe they, they want wins for many reasons. My friend, uh, I know he wants wins just so he can show off. In the past, there weren't any consequences for boosting, but that's starting to change. This week, South Korea passed a law that could put boosters in jail. Chris says he's not worried about getting in trouble, but he knows that his business isn't exactly making him any friends. You think if you didn't own this business and you were just a regular player, do you think you'd be pissed off at people like you? Definitely, yeah. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't be happy if someone had, you know, um, the same wins as me, but I knew that he didn't put nearly as much of the time that I did. Um, but then again, at the end of the day, you know who the better player is. Yeah, that was I wasn't gonna get that. <laughs> Damn. 